has long been recognized as the gold standard for diagnosis and follow-up of pericardial effusion. Similarly, echocardiography can be used to delineate pericardial masses and cysts. In recent years, it has become apparent that Doppler echocardiography provides a non-invasive means of precisely characterizing hemodynamic disturbances due to pericardial pathology. During this presentation, we will discuss the use of echocardiography for the diagnosis of pericardial effusion, pericardial masses, constrictive pericarditis, absent pericardium, and pericardial cysts. As with the previous programs in this series, the pathology slides have been supplied by Dr. William Edwards. The pericardium is a sac which, in this specimen, has been opened. The inner layer is attached to the myocardium. It is referred to as the epicardium or as the visceral pericardium. The outer layer is the parietal pericardium. Normally, the pericardial sac contains about 30 cc's of fluid. The pericardium covers the proximal portion of the great arteries. Posteriorly, at the entrance of the pulmonary veins into the left atrium, the pericardium reflects on itself. Epicardium folds over into parietal pericardium. Hence, there is no pericardial sac covering the posterior portion of the left atrium. We will begin the echocardiographic discussion with the diagnosis of pericardial effusion. Echocardiography is routinely used to detect pericardial effusion and to determine the size of effusions. Pericardial fluid can be clearly differentiated from pleural fluid. Associated masses and strands within the pericardial space can be delineated and 2D and Doppler echo allow diagnosis of cardiac tamponade. Once diagnosed, tamponade is most safely relieved by echo-guided pericardiocentesis. During this program, we will discuss the first four applications. Echo-directed pericardiocentesis will be discussed on tape number 12. In this still frame and all subsequent examples, pericardial fluid will be indicated by the abbreviation PF. This patient has cardiac amyloid with a small pericardial effusion, particularly evident in this systolic frame. This bright white line is the parietal pericardium, and this small echo-free space is the pericardial fluid. There is also fluid anteriorly adjacent to the right ventricle. This 56-year-old female also has a small pericardial effusion. The M-mode cursor crosses the small anterior and posterior echo-free spaces. This is the resultant M-mode. This is visceral pericardium, and this is parietal. The clear space between them is the small pericardial fluid collection. This is a pathologic specimen from a patient who expired with moderate pericardial effusion. This effusion was fibrinous. Note the rough texture of the epicardial and parietal pericardial surfaces. This 58-year-old female has systemic lupus erythematosus. Lupus pericarditis has resulted in this moderate circumferential pericardial effusion. The irregular epicardial surface is due to fibrin deposition.
This 16-year-old developed nonspecific pericarditis and gradually accumulated this large pericardial effusion. In apical four-chamber format, you can appreciate that fluid surrounds the left ventricle, right ventricle, and right atrium. Returning to the parasternal long axis view, the visceral and parietal pericardial layers join each other here, between the aorta and left atrium. The pericardium does not cover the descending thoracic aorta. Hence, with pericardial effusion, there is no fluid observed behind the descending aorta. This is important for differentiating pericardial effusion from pleural effusion. This subcostal view demonstrates a large pericardial effusion, which proved to be tuberculous. In addition to the large effusion, notice the thickening of the epicardium. This is likely due to the inflammatory response. Many patients have a considerable layer of epicardial fat, as demonstrated on this short axis slice through the left and right ventricles, and this slice through the apex. It is important to remember this entity when dealing with patients who are referred to exclude pericardial disease. This parasternal long axis view is from a 59-year-old male. Epicardial fat gives the impression of an echo-free space surrounding the right ventricle. You must be wary of diagnosing pericardial fluid when the only echo-free space is small and anterior. The regional expansion function is now being used to inspect this apparent echo-free space. There are actually multiple echoes representing a soft tissue density within this space. This is the typical appearance of epicardial fat. Not infrequently, pericardial and pleural effusions may coexist in the same patient, and therefore it is necessary to make the distinction by echocardiography. This patient has a large left pleural effusion. Note that the borders of the effusion do not converge between the aorta and left atrium. Part of the fluid is actually behind the descending aorta. This bright line is the parietal pericardium, while this is the interface of the pleural fluid with lung parenchyma. This patient has both pleural and pericardial effusions. Here again, the parietal and visceral pericardia converge anterior to the aorta, so that only a small amount of pericardial fluid appears between the left atrium and the aorta. In contrast, 
The pleural effusion appears behind the descending aorta. This 57-year-old female with cardiomyopathy has a large left pleural effusion. Remember that pleural fluid, which is an excellent transmitter of ultrasound, creates a unique echo window for imaging the heart. The transducer has been placed on the patient's back near the lower border of the left scapula. Sound beams first traverse the pleural fluid. This is the descending thoracic aorta in short axis. And this is a short axis view of the left ventricle. A tiny pericardial fluid collection is present here. In real time, you will appreciate the reduced left ventricular function with regional wall motion abnormalities. These echoes are from clumps of fibrin within the pleural effusion. This is a subcostal view from the young male with nonspecific pericarditis whose parasternal and apical images were previously presented. The transducer is angulated to demonstrate a strand of fibrin within this large pericardial fluid collection. These strands are commonly seen with inflammatory and with hemorrhagic effusions. Note also the diastolic right atrial collapse. This patient had signs of early tamponade and 600 cc's of hemorrhagic fluid were removed by echo-guided pericardiocentesis. This is a subcostal view obtained after the procedure. Attention is focused on a small pocket of residual fluid around the right atrium. Multiple fibrin strands traverse this pocket. Clumps or strands of fibrin are also commonly identified within pleural effusions. In addition, segments of atelectatic lung are frequently visualized. The heart is being imaged through this left pleural effusion with the transducer near the left scapula. This mass within the fluid is atelectatic lung. This 32-year-old female has a left pleural effusion and a small pericardial effusion. Whenever pericardial effusion is identified, it is important to inspect the pericardial space and the pericardial surfaces for masses. This patient has several large masses attached to the parietal pericardium. These were due to Hodgkin's disease. This patient developed a low output state shortly after aortic valve replacement, and this study was obtained as an emergency. His prosthesis was normal by Doppler, and left ventricular function was only mildly decreased. He has developed a large hematoma in the pericardial space, and it is compressing the right atrium. This is the typical location for hematomas after valve replacement or coronary bypass surgery, and therefore this region should always be carefully inspected with this type of clinical presentation. 
If this lesion cannot be confidently excluded with surface echocardiography, including imaging from the right parasternal window, then a transesophageal study should be employed. This patient presented with a febrile illness and hypotension. In this parasternal long axis image, a large pericardial effusion is easily identified. Notice that the fluid collects anterior to the descending aorta, thereby assuring that this is pericardial rather than pleural effusion. The epicardial surface is ragged in appearance, and there are clumps of echoes floating within the fluid and attached to the epicardial surface. In real time, you will see that the heart swings slightly within the large effusion. And you will also see diastolic collapse of the right ventricle, a feature of tamponade which we will discuss later. In apical four-chamber format, the shaggy epicardial border and the clumps within the pericardial fluid are more apparent. In real time, you will see the right atrium collapse in diastole, another 2D sign of tamponade. This view was obtained by tilting the transducer inferiorly from the standard apical four-chamber view. The etiology of this cerebriform mass of echoes was clarified by echo-directed pericardiocentesis, which was carried out both to relieve tamponade and to obtain fluid for culture. This fluid grew a gram-negative organism called Moraxella. Subsequent pericardiectomy was performed and the patient has done well in the intervening six years. We will now discuss the echo diagnosis of tamponade. Tamponade cannot be accurately diagnosed solely on the basis of the size of effusion. The rate of accumulation of fluid is also a critical factor. Slowly accumulating effusions, such as those seen with most malignancies, allow the pericardium time to stretch, thereby increasing its compliance. Hence, large volumes can accumulate before a critical elevation in intrapericardial pressure is reached. On the other hand, rapidly accumulating effusions, such as those seen with spontaneous or iatrogenic cardiovascular perforations, or after closed chest injuries, find the pericardium relatively non-compliant. And a small volume of fluid accumulating rapidly can result in a marked elevation of intrapericardial pressure. Cardiac tamponade can occur in these circumstances with as little as one to 200 cc's of fluid. M-mode signs of tamponade include diastolic notching of the RV free wall, and respiratory variation in the size of the ventricles. The RV collapses with expiration. This M mode demonstrates a large pericardial effusion, which is most notable behind the left ventricle. With expiration, the right ventricle collapses, while the left ventricular internal dimension increases. With inspiration, the right ventricular cavity enlarges and the LV decreases in size. These reciprocal changes are due to ventricular interdependence, a phenomenon which we will discuss in more detail when we consider the Doppler diagnosis of tamponade. Two-dimensional echo signs of tamponade include diastolic collapse of the right atrium and or right ventricle, 
and reciprocal variation in ventricular chamber sizes with respiration. As with M mode, the left ventricular internal dimension will decrease with inspiration and increase with expiration. Finally, the inferior vena cava may be enlarged and venous pulsations may be absent. This is a parasternal short axis view from the 58-year-old female with systemic lupus and moderate pericardial effusion. This is diastolic RV collapse. The diastolic timing of the RV collapse can be verified by M-mode. Here the M-mode cursor crosses the short axis image at mitral valve level. This is the collapse or notching of the right ventricle. From the ECG and from the mitral M-mode, you see that the RV collapse occurs in diastole. This patient has a large pericardial effusion, which proved to be hemorrhagic. Diastolic collapse of the right atrium is evident. In real time, diastolic RV collapse is also present. This 68-year-old male presented with cardiac tamponade and proved to have lymphomatous involvement of the pericardium. On this apex up four-chamber view, right atrial collapse is demonstrated. As with RV collapse, M-mode can be used to confirm the diastolic timing of the right atrial collapse. Here the M-mode cursor crosses the right atrium and the pericardial fluid which surrounds the right atrium. This is the M-mode of the right atrial wall. This upward motion due to RA collapse occurs before the QRS complex. This is a subcostal image of the IVC from a patient with tamponade. The IVC and hepatic veins are slightly engorged. In real time, you will observe that the amplitude of venous pulsations is greatly reduced and that the IVC does not show the normal collapse with inspiration. This is a short axis view of the spine, abdominal aorta, and IVC obtained immediately after pericardiocentesis. In real time, you will see that vigorous venous pulsations have returned. Doppler echocardiography can be used to diagnose tamponade, even in cases which do not demonstrate RV or RA collapse on 2D exam. 
pulsed wave Doppler abnormalities parallel the unique hemodynamic abnormalities associated with tamponade. For the Doppler diagnosis of tamponade, it is critical to correlate changes in the pulsed wave velocity spectra with timing of the respiratory cycle. This is the deflection from a heat-sensitive nasal respirometer. The deflection is upward with inspiration and downward with expiration. There is a small phase delay between the actual onset of inspiration and the deflection on the nasal respirometer. This is in the range of 120 to 200 milliseconds. Hence, the onset of inspiration is here and the onset of expiration is here. One of the characteristic abnormalities with tamponade is a decrease in the mitral flow velocity with inspiration. The pulsed wave sample volume has been positioned between the tips of the mitral leaflets. The mitral velocity profile decreases with the first beat of inspiration. Compare the size here with the first beat of expiration or with end expiratory apnea. The mitral velocity reflects the pressure gradient between the left atrium and left ventricle. And since there is only a small gradient between pulmonary veins and left atrium, we use the mitral velocity as an indication of the gradient from the pulmonary veins to the left ventricle. It is important to understand how this filling gradient is affected by respiration. This slide represents apnea. There is a slightly greater pressure in the pulmonary veins than in the LV, which creates this filling gradient. In these diagrams, the size of this gradient will be depicted according to the width of the arrows, and the relative magnitude of the pressures will be represented by the size of the letter P. In normal individuals, as intrathoracic pressure decreases with inspiration, there is a decrease in the pulmonary venous pressure. There is also a decrease in intrapericardial pressure, which is of approximately the same magnitude. Since this decrease is fully transmitted to the left ventricle, the decrease in LV is equal to the decrease in the pulmonary veins. The effective filling gradient, or driving pressure between the pulmonary veins and left ventricle, therefore shows little change with inspiration. Using pressure curves from the catheterization laboratory, the pulmonary wedge pressure which corresponds to pulmonary venous pressure, falls from expiration to inspiration. However, the left ventricular diastolic pressure shows a similar fall. Therefore, the diastolic filling gradient between the wedge pressure and LV diastolic pressure shows little change from expiration to inspiration. Since this gradient determines the mitral velocity profile, the mitral flow velocity integral is also unchanged from expiration to inspiration. For the patient with a tense pericardial effusion, the situation is different. The pulmonary veins are outside the pericardial sac. Therefore, the decrease in intrathoracic pressure with inspiration still results in a decrease in pulmonary venous pressure of equal magnitude to that seen in normal individuals. However, the distended pericardial sac does not allow full transmission of the change in intrathoracic pressure to the left ventricle. Hence, there is relatively little decrease in LV diastolic pressure. Since the pulmonary venous pressure has shown a normal fall with inspiration, but the LV diastolic pressure has remained almost unchanged, the filling gradient has greatly decreased. Returning to the typical pressure profiles, for the patient with tamponade, inspiration results in a decrease in wedge pressure compared to expiration. 
However, the LV diastolic pressure changes very little from expiration to inspiration, which means that the inspiratory diastolic filling gradient is significantly decreased compared to expiration. Again, since the filling gradient determines the mitral velocity profile, the flow velocity integral with inspiration is significantly decreased compared to expiration. This is a pulsed wave Doppler profile of left ventricular inflow from a patient with tamponade. This illustrates the decrease in mitral velocity with inspiration compared to expiration. The abbreviation AC stands for aortic closure. The isovolumic relaxation time for patients with tamponade is lengthened with inspiration compared to expiration. The reduction in diastolic filling gradient with inspiration causes the mitral valve to open later, and this is what prolongs the IVRT. For patients with tamponade, the pulmonary venous Doppler velocity parallels the mitral velocity. There is a decrease with inspiration and increase with expiration. This study is from a 16-year-old male with tamponade. This is left ventricle and left atrium. The sample volume is positioned in color flow from the paraseptal pulmonary vein. This is the resultant Doppler spectrum. With inspiration, the pulmonary venous velocity decreases. There is a marked increase in velocity with the onset of expiration. In real time, you will be able to both see and hear the characteristic variation in pulmonary venous velocity signals. These are mitral and tricuspid velocity profiles from a patient with tamponade. You will notice that the changes in tricuspid velocity with respiration are reciprocal to the changes in mitral velocity. With inspiration, there is an increase in tricuspid velocity, while the first beat of expiration shows a significant decrease in tricuspid velocity. These reciprocal changes are likely due to the phenomenon of ventricular interdependence. With tamponade, the elevated pressure in the pericardial sac, which surrounds the heart, maintains a constant total cardiac volume. In these schematics, the relative magnitude of pulmonary venous and LV diastolic pressures are again represented by the size of the letter P and the magnitude of the diastolic filling gradient is proportional to the width of the arrows. We have already seen that inspiration results in a lesser fall in LV diastolic pressure than in pulmonary venous pressure, thereby decreasing the diastolic filling gradient and decreasing the mitral TVI. With decreased LV filling, the ventricular septum shifts to the left this allows for an increased volume to flow into the right ventricle. And this is reflected by the increased tricuspid velocity integral with inspiration. With expiration, the opposite sequence occurs. Pulmonary venous pressure rises, again without change in LV diastolic pressure. Therefore, the diastolic filling gradient increases and this increases the mitral velocity. This increased left ventricular filling results in a rightward shift of the ventricular septum, which impedes right ventricular filling. This is reflected in the decreased tricuspid flow velocity integral with expiration. These respiratory variations in right heart filling are also evident from the pulsed wave spectrum from the hepatic veins. In inspiration, 
we see an increase in both systolic and diastolic forward flow velocities, which are recorded below the baseline. With expiration, there is a marked decrease in forward flow. This always involves the diastolic component of forward flow, and in some cases of tamponade, such as this, the systolic component of forward flow is also severely diminished with expiration. Accompanying the marked expiratory decrease in forward flow is a significant increase in flow reversal with expiration. Both the decrease in forward flow and the increase in reverse flow are likely due to the rightward septal shift with expiration, which impedes right heart filling. Dr. Daryl Burstow, working in our echo laboratory, examined the Doppler velocity profiles for 20 normal control subjects, 16 patients with pericardial effusion and tamponade, and 12 patients with pericardial effusion without tamponade. This figure shows the mean percentage change from apnea for the mitral E velocity. For patients with tamponade, the reduction in mitral E velocity with inspiration and the increase with expiration are clearly different from the minor respiratory changes that occurred in normals or in effusions without tamponade. While not as dramatic, the reciprocal respiratory changes in tricuspid E velocity still separate the patients with tamponade from those without tamponade. Most impressive is the decreased E velocity with the first beat of expiration. To summarize the pulsed wave Doppler changes that occur in patients with cardiac tamponade, with inspiration, there is an increase in the forward flow velocity in the hepatic vein and a decrease in the pulmonary vein velocity. Inspiration also results in increase in the tricuspid velocity, especially an increase in the E velocity, while the mitral velocity decreases with inspiration. The reduced diastolic filling gradient on the left side means that mitral opening will be delayed, and hence the IVRT increases with inspiration. With expiration, we observe the opposite set of findings. The hepatic vein shows decreased forward flow with an increase in flow reversals, while the pulmonary vein velocity increases. The tricuspid velocity decreases with the first beat of expiration, while the mitral velocity increases. Finally, in patients with tamponade, the LV isovolumic relaxation time decreases with expiration. Constrictive pericarditis provides a unique challenge to the echocardiographer. Since surgical stripping of the pericardium can markedly improve the patient's symptoms and functional status, it is very important to be able to identify this disorder and particularly to be able to differentiate it from restrictive cardiomyopathy. In patients with constrictive pericarditis, 2D echocardiography may demonstrate a bright, thickened pericardium. However, it is often difficult to obtain clear definition of the edge of the pericardium that is adjacent to lung. Because of this, 2D echo cannot usually be used to precisely measure pericardial thickness. With constrictive pericarditis, as with tamponade, the IVC and hepatic veins are usually dilated. As opposed to restrictive cardiomyopathy, the atria are most commonly normal to only mildly enlarged. LV systolic function is usually well preserved. M mode echo can be used to demonstrate multiple parallel pericardial echoes, creating increased thickness. With constriction, the motion of the posterior wall in diastole is often flattened, reflecting the plateau in filling and septal motion may be abnormal. 
Diastolic septal notching is another M-mode sign that has been associated with constrictive pericarditis. This patient had pericardial calcification on chest x-ray. On this parasternal short axis view, the myocardium is normal in thickness. The pericardium appears thickened over the LV anterior wall, over the lateral wall, and the inferior wall. The pericardium covering the inferior surface of the right ventricle also appears thickened. An M-mode cursor has been directed across the left ventricle. The marked pericardial thickening is quite apparent. There is also a flattened motion of the posterior wall and diastolic septal notching. This is an apical four-chamber view from the same patient with constrictive pericarditis. The clinical presentation of these patients can be identical to that of patients with restrictive cardiomyopathy. You will recall from tape number seven that patients with restrictive cardiomyopathy, especially those with the idiopathic variety, have marked enlargement of the atria. With constrictive pericarditis, the atria are upper normal, as in this case, or at most, mildly enlarged. This is because the atria are within the constricting pericardium. It is not always possible to clearly demonstrate pericardium that has thickened on the 2D study. Furthermore, not all patients with thickened pericardium will have constrictive physiology. For these reasons, the addition of Doppler to define hemodynamics has been invaluable in the approach to patients in whom constriction is in question. The Doppler findings for constrictive pericarditis are very similar to those which we have previously discussed for tamponade. As opposed to tamponade, patients with constriction are less often tachycardic, and therefore the E and A velocities are usually clearly separated on the PW Doppler spectra. Attention to the respiratory cycle is critical when identifying patients with constrictive hemodynamics. With inspiration, there is a normal fall in pulmonary venous pressure, but the change in intrathoracic pressure is not transmitted across the thickened pericardium to the left ventricle. Since the pulmonary venous pressure falls and the LV diastolic pressure is unchanged, there is a decrease in the diastolic filling gradient with inspiration. Because the filling gradient determines the magnitude of mitral velocities, we see a reduction in mitral velocity with inspiration. The constricting peel keeps total intrapericardial volume constant, and we therefore see ventricular interdependence. The inspiratory fall in LV volume leads to shift of the septum to the left. Hence, right ventricular filling increases with inspiration, and this will be manifested as an increase in the tricuspid velocity profile. With expiration, the opposite set of events occurs. While the increase in intrathoracic pressure does not affect the LV diastolic pressure, the pulmonary venous pressure shows its normal increase. Therefore, the diastolic filling gradient is increased, and the mitral velocity profile also increases. With increased LV filling, because intrapericardial volume is being held constant, the septum shifts to the right, which decreases right ventricular filling, as reflected here by the decreased RV volume. This results in an expiratory decrease in the tricuspid time-velocity integral. 
This is a pulsed wave Doppler recording from a patient with constrictive pericarditis. The sample volume was placed between the tips of the mitral leaflets. Remember that inspiration mechanically begins slightly before the upstroke on the tracing from the nasal respirometer. Notice that the mitral spectrum decreases with inspiration. The decrease is greatest for the first beat of inspiration, and it affects the E velocity to a greater extent than the A velocity. This patient underwent left and right heart catheterization. We are focusing on the diastolic pressure curves, pulmonary wedge pressure, and left ventricular pressure. With inspiration, there is a marked decrease in the gradient between the wedge pressure and LV diastolic pressure compared to expiration. As we have already seen, this results in a significant decrease in the mitral E velocity with the first beat of inspiration compared to expiration. As expected, the pulmonary venous profile from this same patient with constriction shows a decrease in inspiration compared to expiration. This patient underwent successful pericardiectomy. Postoperatively, the mitral velocity profile has returned to normal. There is no significant variation in the time velocity integral with respiration. This is the mitral flow velocity integral from another patient with constrictive pericarditis. Phonocardiography has been used to identify aortic closure. In addition to the fall in mitral velocity with inspiration, note that the IVRT increases with inspiration as compared to expiration. We will now examine right-sided Doppler spectra for a patient with constrictive pericarditis before and after pericardiectomy. This recording was obtained with a sample volume between the tips of the tricuspid leaflets. The tricuspid E velocity is decreased for the first beat of expiration compared to inspiration. Furthermore, the tricuspid deceleration time falls from inspiration to expiration. Post pericardiectomy, there is very little variation in tricuspid time velocity integral from inspiration to expiration. In addition, the variation in deceleration time throughout the respiratory cycle is blunted. This patient's hepatic vein profile was also typical for constriction. During end expiratory apnea, the profile is normal with systolic forward flow velocity slightly exceeding diastolic forward velocity. And there is a small atrial flow reversal. With inspiration, both forward velocities increase. The key finding, as expected from our preceding discussion, occurs with the first beat of expiration. There is a reduction in both forward velocities. Diastolic forward flow is almost non-existent, and this is accompanied by a marked increase in the atrial reversal. Hence, with expiration, there is a significant decrease in the ratio of the time velocity integral of forward flow compared to the TVI of reverse flow. Following pericardiectomy, the hepatic vein Doppler pattern has returned to nearly normal. Although there is still a prominent atrial reversal with expiration, it is reduced in magnitude compared to the preoperative findings. Most importantly, systolic and diastolic forward flow velocities are now preserved, even with expiration. This is a 2D study from a 38-year-old male with constrictive pericarditis. The transducer is in the esophagus behind the left atrium. The transesophageal study was performed because of technical difficulty in obtaining 2D and Doppler information from the surface study. Overall gain has been decreased to enhance appreciation of the thickened pericardium.
The pulse sample volume has been placed at the tips of the mitral leaflets. Flow through the mitral valve is away from the transducer. However, the Doppler display has been inverted so that the mitral profile appears above the baseline as it does with Doppler during a surface echocardiographic study. By paying attention to the respirometer, the decrease in mitral velocity with the first beat of inspiration is very evident. Compare inspiration with expiration. This is the left atrial appendage of the same patient as viewed from the esophagus. And this is the left upper pulmonary vein. The pulse sample volume is in the pulmonary vein, and flow from the vein is toward the transducer. With apnea, we see a normal pulmonary venous Doppler pattern. Systolic velocity is slightly greater than diastolic, and there is a small atrial reversal. With inspiration, the systolic velocity is diminished. The deceleration slope is perpendicular, and the diastolic flow is completely in the reverse direction. This means that the pathophysiology which we previously discussed is so exaggerated that the normal diastolic filling gradient from pulmonary veins to left atrium has been converted to a regurgitant gradient during inspiration. Dr. Hatley has examined the Doppler profiles from a series of seven patients with constrictive pericarditis and compared them to 20 healthy subjects, as well as 12 patients with restrictive cardiomyopathy. This figure is from her article. I and E indicate inspiration and expiration. For each parameter, the zero line is the magnitude during apnea. So the data points represent the percent change compared to apnea. Because of the decrease in diastolic filling gradient, the mitral valve opens later with inspiration for patients with constrictive pericarditis. This results in an increase in IVRT with inspiration. Patients with restrictive cardiomyopathy usually have a foreshortened IVRT compared to normals and there is relatively little change in IVRT during inspiration. This figure plots the mitral e-velocity during the respiratory cycle. The marked decrease in e-velocity with inspiration and increase with expiration that you have seen demonstrated for patients with constriction does not occur with restrictive cardiomyopathy. Similarly, the decrease in tricuspid e-velocity with expiration, which is consistently seen with constrictive pericarditis, is either non-existent or blunted with restrictive cardiomyopathy. This figure is from work by Dr. Appleton in collaboration at Stanford with Drs. Hatley and Pop. These are pressure tracings from one of 14 patients with restrictive cardiomyopathy. You'll observe that the early diastolic gradient is very large compared to late diastole. In addition, there is a rapid equalization of wedge and LV pressures in early diastole, which means that the deceleration time is shortened. This is the pulsed wave Doppler spectrum from a patient with cardiac amyloid and restrictive physiology. From tape number seven, you will recall the characteristic increase in E to A ratio and the rapid deceleration time, which measured 130 milliseconds for this patient. Although careful measurements will show that in restrictive cardiomyopathy, the deceleration time shows further decrease with inspiration, you will notice that the mitral time velocity integral remains constant throughout the respiratory cycle. 
Hence, the respiratory Doppler pattern is distinctly different from that of constrictive pericarditis. You can now appreciate that with careful attention to the effect of respiration, Doppler echocardiography is uniquely suited to non-invasively distinguish patients with constrictive pericarditis from those with restrictive cardiomyopathy. Pitfalls in Doppler diagnosis of constrictive pericarditis include false positive diagnosis with unstable sample volume position or chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. The former can be avoided by frequent imaging during the exam and by paying attention to the cyclic changes in the IVRT. Patients with COPD show a reduction in the mitral velocity during inspiration because of increase in the amount of negative intrathoracic pressure generated. However, as opposed to constrictive pericarditis, the maximum reduction in mitral velocity integral occurs later with COPD, with second and third beats of inspiration showing an even larger decrease in velocity than with the first beat of inspiration. False negatives in Doppler diagnosis of constrictive pericarditis may include patients who have early disease and therefore only mild hemodynamic changes, patients with only small localized areas of constriction, and patients who are dehydrated, since reduced preload can potentially mask the aforementioned Doppler changes even in advanced cases of constrictive pericarditis. We will now discuss less common lesions of the pericardium. Patients with congenital absence of the pericardium are usually asymptomatic since this disorder creates no significant functional disturbances. The diagnosis may be suspected at echocardiography because of unusual orientation of the heart within the chest. With congenital absence of the pericardium, views that are ordinarily obtained at the left sternal border are obtained instead with a transducer on the left upper chest near the axilla. Because the plane of the echo beam may not cut the right ventricle in true short axis, you might be misled into thinking that the right ventricle is enlarged. This 56-year-old female has congenital absence of the pericardium. This view, which has the appearance of a parasternal short axis view, was actually obtained with the transducer positioned laterally on the left upper chest. In order to approximate apical views for these patients, a transducer position in the axilla is often required. The echocardiographer, therefore, should suspect this condition when typical images are obtained from the unusual transducer positions mentioned above in the absence of chest wall or spinal abnormalities. Pericardial cysts are uncommon lesions that usually cause no symptoms, although they can be associated with chest discomfort or rhythm disturbances, presumably secondary to localized pressure on the heart. These patients often present for echocardiography because of distortion of the cardiac silhouette on chest x-ray. This patient has a 4 by 5 by 2.0 centimeter pericardial cyst adjacent to the right atrium. On this parasternal short axis image at midventricular level, an echolucent space is noted, lateral to the LV.
The transducer was angulated laterally and superiorly, demonstrating that the clear space is a pericardial cyst, which is largely adjacent to the left atrium. It measured 8 by 10.7 centimeters. This 37-year-old male presented with increasing frequency of atrial fibrillation and the episodes of tachycardia were associated with near syncope. He was referred to us after echocardiography based on parasternal long axis images such as this demonstrated what appeared to be a mass or ledge within the left atrium. This is a parasternal short axis image of the right and left ventricles. We will now scan toward the base and demonstrate that the lesion is actually external to the left atrium. This is the right ventricle, left ventricular outflow tract, and left atrium. This is the ostium of the left inferior pulmonary vein. A cyst compresses the left atrium and was responsible for the shelf-like appearance on the long axis image. Compression of the left atrium by this same pericardial cyst is clearly illustrated on this transesophageal study. This is the right atrium, right ventricle, and left ventricle. The cyst compresses the left atrium, which appears as a small slit. This is the short axis view of coronary sinus and circumflex coronary artery in the AV groove. Scanning inferiorly, the cyst occupies the usual position of the left atrium. Color flow imaging confirmed that there was no communication with the heart as no color appeared within the cyst. The differential diagnosis for a cyst in this position includes pericardial cyst, duplication cyst of the esophagus, and bronchogenic cyst. This large cyst was excised via left thoracotomy. It was found to arise from the epicardium and was described as compressing the left atrium and elevating the pulmonary veins. This compression likely explains the patient's near collapse during rapid atrial fibrillation. This video seminar has once again demonstrated the clinical versatility of combined 2D and Doppler echocardiography. From diagnosis of pericardial effusion to the detection of tamponade, and from identification of pericardial masses and cysts to differentiation of constrictive pericarditis from restrictive cardiomyopathy, the clinician is provided with a powerful tool that provides immediate feedback in the form of anatomic and hemodynamic detail. The next tape in this series will deal with application of 2D and Doppler for the diagnosis of tricuspid and pulmonary valve lesions and for diseases of the aorta.